just most Londoners are winding down for the weekend, the younger generation is only now coming to life to rave. The rave scene has given new life to pirate broadcasting. Raves are no longer backstreet affairs, but have emerged as mainstream and now mostly legal entertainment for the young. Lucrative too. Everybody here has paid £10 to get in. We're off to the powerhouse. It's cool if they're having a night down here tonight. We're doing something there once a month. DJ Brocky is on his way to work to a rave sponsored by the pirate station Cool FM. Top pirate DJs like Brocky can earn hundreds of pounds a session and there's no shortage of bookings. Oh, sorry. Hello. Yeah, good Friday. All right, mate. The music is called Jungle. It's produced electronically, but for dancing it's played on vinyl with a rap accompaniment. It's part of what's become a multi-billion pound dance music industry. But although most raves may now be legal, the government has stepped up its efforts to rid the airwaves of those most actively promoting them, the illegal radio pirates. For the pirates, the airwaves are an extension of the dance floor, taking the beat into the bedsits and tower blocks. Key figures in pirate broadcasting, like DJ Brocky, talk in almost missionary terms. It gives all the people on the street a chance to hear the music roar, like, you know, under, underground. It advertises the raves to them, you know, it gets them, it just, it just informs them exactly what is going on. Without the pirate radio, the rave scene would never thrive. DJ Brocky is on his way back from the rave to the radio station. Like other pirates, Cool FM regularly moves its studio to avoid detection. On condition of not revealing the location, we were taken to Cool's latest lair. Cool FM broadcasts some 70 hours a week, mainly at weekends. Every performance is an act of creation, mixing words and music. It's a two-way experience, though. Listeners in Charlton have asked for an on-air greeting. The call is taken by DJ Wildchild, who passes it on to the MC, who then shouts it over the music. It's the whole buzz of it. They can ring us up any time of the day they want. And, you know, ask for a shout. If you're legal, you can't do that. You can do it, but it's all done properly. It's all one second break in it, so no one swears down the phone line. Transmitting from around northeast London, Cool FM reaches beyond the M25 and claims thousands of listeners, like Nicky. I listen to Cool FM and Eruption FM because they're the best um, jungle station going. Cool's the best out of all of them. I listen to Cool. Nicky and his mates are typical of the pirate station's audience. 15 and 16 year olds, they tune in at virtually every opportunity. Yeah, but how many hours are we talking about? Yeah, as long as we're awake. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're at a rave. You get the vibe what you might get from a rave. Bubble so you bubble at home in your bedroom or your kitchen, wherever you've got your radio. Not everyone can afford to go out every weekend. So having a pipe radio station is like having a rave at your house, really. Everyone doesn't like to go by the, by the books, in other words. People like to ring up a station knowing it's illegal. They like to go to a rave knowing maybe it's not a, it's not, they've got a license for the rave. You know what I mean? It's, it's part of you know, street culture to try you know, to do things illegal. But Big Brother is listening. The Radio Investigation Service comes under the Department of Trade and Industry, the DTI. Their 24-hour monitoring station outside Baldock covers the entire country. British broadcasting has traditionally been one of the most regulated in the world. Even listening to a pirate station is technically illegal, and it would be equally illegal for us to indicate the pirate's frequencies. The job of the Radio Investigation Service is to deal with the interference the pirates cause to those who are legal and licensed. We get complaints from people like the police, the fire, ambulance services, airports, all suffering from interference from pirate radio and indeed from uh, broadcasters themselves, uh, legitimate broadcasters uh, don't like the way that the pirates um, steal the airwaves and uh, take their audiences and advertising. We've had genuine cases of interference to uh, airport landing systems. 
I mean, how more serious can you get than that sort of radio interference? Any accidents ever resulted that you know of? Never any accidents on the aircraft side resulted, thank goodness. Uh, but my, but uh, really, these um, pirate transmitters are very, very close to airport frequencies. The DTI's boys on the beat operate in unmarked cars, using sophisticated signal locating gear. There's another pirate station there. On there. There's another one coming up here, which is quite a spread. That's causing quite a lot of problems there. These men are the government's electronic pest controllers. Their mission, to seek and destroy the pirates' equipment. To be effective, they have to keep the same hours as the pirates. We work generally on demand. Um, we work a standard nine to five, but we're always on permanent call, so 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we have been known to turn out Boxing Day and Christmas Day, on, uh, if, when the need's been there. Tracking the pirates through their favorite terrain is a game of cat and mouse. And with its bigger, better whiskers, the DTI cat has the advantage. But that doesn't diminish the thrill of the chase. I have a certain sneaking admiration for their abilities. They, um, it is not easy to put on a program. Uh, it's not easy to transmit. It's not easy to build a transmitter. And they achieve it. Most of them, are, when you, if, should you ever meet them, are, are quite uh, normal people. Even if we've had them in court a number of times, they still invariably talk to them. We always try to shake hands at the end of any interview and leave like gentlemen. I think what it is now this day is they know most of the faces, bad as it sounds. They know who's who. They know most of the cars. There's lots of ways. You know, it's like, you know, they just sit outside and just watch. When they get a signal, so if they were to drive up here now and we were transmitting from there and they had a signal, they just, all they've got to do is just sit down and just watch and observe. Yeah, but your studio can be 20 miles away. Yeah, you? but all they've got to do is follow us then. Well, this was one of um, Cool FM's first um, output sites. This was our studio originally. That was our chill out room, and that was the front room. This, this, this actual flat belonged to two of the DJs on the station. It was their own flat, and they lost it through Cool FM. But it's raided? Yeah. One day we came back and it was all metalled up. It was here for about two years straight, broadcasting every week in and week out. It's got a lot of memories, this place, man, believe me. It's one of the major places. This is where we had a major battle with the DTI, you know, and we used to be all up there, that's where our area used to be from up there. And this is, this is just a major, another major spot for Cool FM and the jungle scene. The more canny pirates try to avoid the DTI by splitting their hardware between sites. The studio can be almost anywhere, but usually it's a flat or a bed sit. It's linked by microwave to what's called a midpoint which in turn is linked often miles away to the rig, the transmitter, and with it, the aerial. You put your aerial on the highest point possible, like it would be one of these tool blocks here, and you transmit. That really, it sounds, it sounds really quick and short, but that's, it's as simple as that. Cool FM have the experience and the expertise, but virtually anyone can set up a pirate station for as little as £500. This is a range of uh, pirate radio equipment. Uh, we start uh, here, which has got uh, the four cassettes, uh, soldered into the uh, middle there and that will keep going for quite some time and right underneath itself is the uh, transmitter. Crude but uh, effective. And then uh, moving up uh, the range this would uh, link a uh, studio with the uh, transmitter at a remote site. So that's a microwave link? That's a microwave link, what we call an LMB. And a more typical uh, transmitter that uh, we found fairly recently in London is this one. And uh, the point of having uh, this bolt in it is that uh, that's to try and stop us uh, getting away with it. But uh, inside here is uh, a much more powerful transmitter. Um, goes up to about two, three hundred watts and would uh, transmit across most of London.